Okay, let's do an example. We're going to go back to the numbers game where, just as a reminder, we're imagining that there's some set of numbers that we don't know, and we're, we get to see a subset of those numbers. Uh, we imagine that basically uh, each observation is drawn uniformly from that set, and we're hypothesizing about what those numbers are. Uh, that is, what is the set of numbers that we don't know. Previously, I just showed you what happens if you uh, compute the maximum likelihood estimate and the MAP estimate, maximum a posteriori, and the posterior predictive distribution. Now that we have to, the tools to do it, let's calculate those ourselves. We're going to look in a bit of a simpler case. We're going to imagine we have these four hypotheses, all, which is all the numbers from 1 to 99 are possible, that, and each one has a 1 in 100 probability, just the even numbers, just the powers of 2, and just the powers of 2 apart from 32. So note that this uh, is the same as this one, just there's no 32. We're going to imagine that we've seen a data set, D equals 2, 8, 16, 64. So notice that this is the powers of 2 without 4 and without 32. Remember that intuitively looking at this, to us, it looks a lot like the rule that produce these numbers is the powers of, of 2. But we want to uh, infer that in a mathematical principled way. Um, OK, so first let's ask, what is the maximum likelihood estimate, MLE? And let's start with H all. The, the, to calculate the likelihood, that's probability of data given H all. That is product over X in D, probability of X given H all. Okay, what is this value? Well, we said that H says that there's a uniform distribution over 100 values. So this is 1 over 100, no matter what X is, uh, as long as X is within this set. And all these numbers are within the set, so this equals 1 over 100 to the fourth power. So what happens if we actually calculate those numbers? I plugged them in here. So again, for H all, our likelihood was 1 over 100 to the fourth power. We can compute that pretty easily ourselves. 1 over 100 to the fourth power. Well, that's going to be 1 over 10 to the eighth power. I'm writing that here in scientific notation, 1e minus 8. That is 1 times 10 to the minus 8th power. OK, we're going to, be use, we're going to be using scientific notation often uh, in this class to represent especially probabilities, because probabilities are often very, very small like this. I wouldn't want to write 0 0.1234567 which is uh, this number. Uh, OK, so that's uh, for H all. H even is 1 over 50 to the fourth power, so it's 16 times that. That's uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 7. For H pow 2 and H pow 2 minus 32, we have these two numbers. Again, this is 1 over 6 to the 4. This is 1 over 5, 1 over 5 to the 4. 
So what is the maximum likelihood estimate? Well, it's the maximum of these likelihoods. So that is h pow 2 minus 32. Again, note that the likelihood is just going to consider all these hypotheses equivalently. We might think that pow 2 is a better hypothesis, but clearly pow 2 minus 32 has a higher likelihood because it has fewer values in it and 32, the value that it doesn't have, is not observed in our data set. Of course, intuitively, that seems like the wrong conclusion because, again, powers of 2 seems much more reasonable to us. So recall that we put a prior on our hypotheses based on how intuitively reasonable they seem. That is, uh, before we saw any data, how likely we are to think that this, uh, that each of these hypotheses was the process that was generating the data that we saw, that is our set of numbers. Uh, and so I put a prior here, I'm making the numbers simple for our case. Uh, intuitively, we think that the powers of 2 minus 32 is a very unreasonable hypothesis. So I'm giving it a low prior, and I'm giving us a uniform prior over the other three hypotheses. So now let's ask, what is our maximum a posteriori estimate? Well, what is that? That is the maximum of the probability of hypothesis given data. Uh, notice that it's the hypothesis is in the front here, data in the back. So let's start with H all. What is the probability of H all given D? Well, let's put it into our Bayes theorem. It's the probability of D given H all probability of H all times probability of data no given hypothesis. Okay, the top, we, we've already computed both of these. The right part, that's our prior, 0 0.33. That's our likelihood, that's 1e minus 8. How about this guy? Well, the way we compute that is we have to sum over our hypotheses of this top part, probability of D given H, probability of H. And let's put an H prime here uh, just to distinguish, to make sure it's clear that this H is not the same as this H. Uh, okay, so we can compute this here. We have uh, 1e minus 8 times 0 0.3. And let's do it for all of them so that we can get our bottom. So, so this thing is going to be p of d equals 1e minus 8 times 0 0.33. That's for H all, 1.6e minus 7 times 0 0.33. Again, same prior, plus 7.7e minus 4 times 0 0.33, plus 1.6e minus 3 times 0 0.01. That's our prior for H pound minus 32. Okay, so note that there are four terms here, 1, 2, 3, 4. And each one is just the likelihood times the prior for each of our hypotheses. If we plug all that in, 
I did that for you, we get this number, probability of D equals 0 0.00027. So we shouldn't be surprised that this is a small number. This is the probability of seeing our exact data set out of all the possible data sets that we could see. Uh, and of course, the probability that we saw exactly those numbers is pretty small, even if we knew exactly what the set of numbers is. So uh, just this is just to note that we should get used to seeing probability of data. Uh, and for that matter, our likelihood probability of gave data given our hypothesis, we should be used to those numbers being small. Um, so again, notice that all these likelihood values are quite small. But the upside is now we can compute our posterior. We just take this top here, divide it by the bottom. Let's see what numbers we get. Here we go. I plugged in these numbers for us. Our posterior for each of our hypotheses are the greatest one is H pow 2 with posterior probability 0.94. Next is pow 2 minus 32 with 0 0.059. H even and H all, I've had to put in scientific notation, they're both extremely small. Uh, and again, it's easy to see why that is. Certainly, H all and H even have low likelihood, or sorry, have low posterior because they have low likelihood. Again, because there are so many different options for what number can be output that uh, the probability of seeing any given number is very small. For POW2, uh, we, it's a high posterior because it's a, both a reasonably high likelihood and a high prior. POW2 minus 32 has an even higher likelihood, but we gave it a very low prior. So it ends up with a relatively low posterior. So that answers our question. Our maximum a posteriori estimate is H POW 32. Okay, uh, how about our posterior predictive distribution? Well, uh, let's do first the plug-in approximation. Remember the plug-in approximation is easy. What's probability of, let's start with four. What's the probability that we see four given H M L E? Well, it's easy. H M L E, remember for yourself, is POW 2 minus 32. Four is in that. So it is one fifth. Probability of four. Let's try. Let's try. Let's do our map. That's one sixth, because again, our H map is H pow two that has six values in it. How about our posterior predictive distribution? Not. Uh, not the plug-in approximation. Let's actually get our posterior predictive distribution. Probability of four given D. What's that? It is sum over H. Probability of H given D. Probability of, in this case, four given H. So we can write that out. It's 1.2 e minus 5, right? Again, this thing, our probability of h given d, that's exactly our posterior. So here we're looking at uh, h all. Let's draw this nicer here. 1.2 e minus 5 times probability of 4 given h all, 1 over 100. There we go. Plus. We're doing our sum here. Let's go through them all. 1.9 e minus 4 times 1 over 50 plus dot dot dot. Let's just do the last one. 
1.6e minus 2. So looking at the likelihood, 0 0.059, that's our probability of h pow 2 minus 32, times 1 fifth. I did the numbers for you here. If I put them into my calculator, we get 0 0.168. 0 0.168, uh, recall that 1 sixth is 0 0.166. So 0 0.168 is very close to 1 sixth. Draw the six a little nicer. That should be no surprise because our posterior put most of its weight on H pow 2. The uh, predictive distribution of H pow 2 is 1 sixth. We just looked at that, there, that here. So our posterior predictive distribution is very close to 1 sixth. What about, let's do our posterior predictive distribution for 1. Okay, note that 1, it's not even and it's not a power of 2, so it only appears in H all. So our probability, let's make it clear that this is a 1, is well, it's going to be something for H all, but there's a zero probability that it's output by any other. So it's plus zero, plus zero, plus zero. Three of the terms in that sum are zero. What is it for H all? Well, it's the posterior probability of H all, 1.2e minus 5, times the probability that H all produces 1, which is 1 over 100 equals, if we plug that in, turns out we get 1.2e minus 7. So we put extremely low probability on seeing a 1 output in the future. That should be no surprise because our observations are very consistent with the fact that we only see for example, powers of two. Um, so we gave H all a very low posterior probability, uh, and even H all puts a relatively low probability on seeing one, just because H all has so many different options. Notably though, we have not ruled out seeing a one in the future. Uh, so this is, I think, a nice property of using a posterior predictive distribution using kind of this Bayesian framework, which is that we never fully rule out seeing some something happen in the future, which is good if we're, if we're predicting things in the real world. Just because we haven't seen odd numbers in the past uh, doesn't mean we should, with all of our heart, believe that we will never ever see odd numbers in the future.